Today, I'm going to talk about the history and genius behind one of the most powerful tools in all of science. It's often underrated, but it's so important that some of you might have been made to learn it by heart. Of course, I'm talking about the periodic table. So, let's start with a bit of history, shall we? In ancient times, the elements carbon, sulfur, iron, copper, silver, tin, gold, mercury and lead were already known. Then, in 330 BC, Aristotle proposed that four roots, fire, air, earth and water, which Plato started to call elements, formed everything around us. A bit of a downgrade in scientific terms, but at least we got the concept of element. Then, all the way in 1661, in the age of alchemy, Robert Boyle gave the definition for elements as those primitive and simple bodies of which the mixed ones are said to be composed and into which they are ultimately resolved. And during that time, the elements zinc, arsenic, antimony, bismuth and platinum were also discovered. In 1718, Etienne Francois Geoffroy created the first table for the classification of elements, based on chemical affinity. It is considered by some historians as the start of the chemical revolution. Then, in 1789, Antoine Lavoisier wrote his elemental treatise of chemistry, in which elements were defined as substances whose smallest units cannot be broken down further, and thus added oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, phosphorus, mercury, zinc and sulfur to the official lists of elements. He also added heat and light as elements, but let's not talk about that and he also divided them into metals and non-metals. In the beginning of the 19th century, John Dalton, yeah, the same guy that discovered atoms, came up with the term of atomic weight and made a table to group elements by that value. A few years later, German physicist Johann Wolfgang Jobreiner, I hope I, I pronounced that correctly, classified the elements by grouping them into groups of three called triads. In order of increasing atomic weight, and the weight of the middle element generally being the mean of the other two. Some examples are lithium, sodium and potassium, and chlorine, bromine and iodine. In 1862, Alexandre Mille Becuyer de Jean Courtois realized that elements ordered by the atomic weights, like in Dalton's table, displayed similar properties at regular intervals, periodically, and created the jewelry spiral to visualize this. Elements aligned vertically displayed similar properties. Also, tellurium is in the center, as you can see, and thus its name. So, in 1864, John Newlands, a British chemist, realized that these trends in physical properties tended to occur every eight elements when ordered by atomic weight, and created a table to order the 62 elements that they had discovered by the time in eight different groups. However, it has some flaws and superpositions and received a lot of hate and refusal. <laughs> but now, here comes the real deal. The name most of you have probably heard of at least once. Dimitri Mendeleev. In 1869, he got the 63 elements known at that time and arranged them by atomic weight, but also keeping in mind their properties, their valence. Even with a rudimentary version of this table, he correctly pointed out that some elements' atomic weights were wrong. He found it until 1871, and left some gaps for undiscovered elements, even predicting their properties, but and about half of them turned out to be real, like scandium, gallium, germanium, technetium, rhenium, polonium, francium, and protactinium. The arrangement this guy invented is so good that we still use it to the present day, when we have, partly thanks to his predictions, almost double the elements from then. We currently know of 118 elements, by the way. But apart from that, why is the periodic table so allegedly good at classifying the elements? Well, you see, along with them being ordered by atomic number, the number of protons, all the elements in a group, in a vertical column, share the same number of valence electrons and thus similar properties. Also, the period, the horizontal rows, define the number of shells of electrons in the atoms. There is also a trend for atomic radius, from the bottom left corner being the largest to the upper right corner being the smallest. Furthermore, 
electronegativity generally decreases as you go down the groups and is the highest in the rightmost ones. Now, there's something I also want to talk about, and it's stability islands. As you increase atomic mass, atoms start to become unstable heavy. This means that all of the last elements have half-lives, the amount of time that half of the atoms in a substance of a given element will take to decay, of less than a minute, at least for the isotopes that we've discovered so far. However, beyond the current periodic table, a few atomic numbers away, there are some islands where elements are predicted to be potentially stable. This has given rise to what's been named the extended periodic table. I wish good luck to the chemistry students of the 22nd century. Anyway, why haven't we discovered all of this already? No, it's not because scientists don't want to have to learn all of that, though maybe just lightly, but because it's really difficult to make, we don't even know how to do it, and then detect, as the yield is depressingly low, the super heavy atoms. The thing is, up to date, the heaviest elements have been made by smashing already heavy nuclei into each other. But we're gonna need a lot more to continue. In fact, this is all so expensive and difficult that only four labs in the entire world have discovered a super heavy element. So, thanks for watching. I hope I provided some insight and you enjoyed the video. If you did, please drop a like and consider subscribing because my YouTube stats are depressing to say the least. So please help me fix them and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!